This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Did you see the LNP are holding direct action protests now? What? Yeah. Yeah. Are they threatening our way of life? They're standing in my way. They're of threatening life. our way of life. Disrupting traffic, maybe not blocking traffic. Right. But in Brisbane's inner west, as you may be aware, people may be aware, um, former LNP stronghold, now Greens stronghold, we've got federal MP Libby Watson Brown, we've got state MP Michael Berkman. We'll soon have, we'll soon hold the council seats. We'll see. Mm-hmm. But on the day before Australia Day, that's. Uh, the 26th of January. Wait, I, I said Australia Day. Is that? I haven't, <laughs> that's weird. I was like, wait. Cancelled. I fucking cancelled. It's the 26th of January, aka Invasion Day, aka Australia Day, to these people who decided to set up camp outside Elizabeth Watson Brown's office mm-hmm. um, in the sleepy, peaceful suburb of Turinga in Brisbane's inner west and hold up signs about the fact that she would not display the Australian flag. Um, <laughs> context, just <clears throat> on the grapevine, a uh, little, little birdie tells me that the wife of the former LNP member sta- oh. of state parliament in that area had gone to both, like, both Greens offices, maybe more, who knows, and requested Australian flags in the lead up to this. And they'd okay. be like, yeah, sure, because, like, MPs officers have Australian flags, given her these yes. flags, and then they posted this, this like, maybe maybe four to six people standing outside of, of Libby's office at, like, 4 p.m., yeah, holding signs saying, this MP does not display the Australian flag. <laughs> Tell this MP <laughs> to re- respect the flag and just, like, waving their little flaggies. So they got the flag from a Greens MP to then yes. use in the protest saying that Lizzie, Livy should uh, it's, uh, um, display it. It make you think, doesn't it? It really make you think. I mean, maybe they could have just said, look, we would have hung up the bloody Australian flag, but you took our last one. <laughs> what do you want me out. to do? <laughs> yeah. Someone came in and took them all. You drained our, our stock. Uh, well, I think that's disgusting that people protested. I think they should be sent to jail for 12 years with no bail. Mm, and I think that, yeah, it made people feel deeply uncomfortable. I actually think it did, judge, like judging by, as reported to me, the lack of friendly beeping and the looks from passers-by, yeah. <laughs> which I just love to see because, yeah, once they fucking owned that area, they used to own <laughs> Brisbane, and now they're just sadly standing on the- Oh, and it included Barkley McGain, that classic. Um, oh, shit. Yeah, he was Barclay there. McGain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Young LNP famous racist wasn't he like too racist for the LNP? He got kicked out. Yes, he was in a he was in a video filmed at schoolies. I, I think, think or so, something. On, yeah, on the Gold Coast, and was doing horrifically racist shit Extremely about. Extremely racist. G'day guys, we're out here today at schoolies 2019. I'm your Gold Coast young LNP chair, Barclay McGain. We got to stop celebrating a culture that couldn't even invent the bloody wheel for God's sake. Ah, oh, McGain, you've done it again. Good thing he's uh, clearly grown up a lot since then. Just imagine walking through life with the name Barkley Barkley McGain. McGain. I can't imagine (laughs) walking through life with a silly name. (laughs) Talk about the Greens. They blow up anything that doesn't meet every single one of their deranged ideological demands. They are fools. They should be banned from taking part in any (laughs) public debate. Frankly, I've always found the Greens to be a real serious danger to Australia. (laughs) Serious danger to Australia. Welcome, everyone. This is Serious Danger, a podcast about Greens politics in Australia. I'm Tom Ballard. With me, the hilariously named Emerald Moon. This is not an official Greens Party podcast. It is episode 60, motherfuckers. How about that? Wow. Only nine away. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it is okay. made possible with the help of the Green Institute and it is produced by Michael the Griff Griffin. This week we're having a big old chat about the political fights swirling around, the Indigenous voice to Parliament, the referendum, calls for treaty. Everyone loves the Greens at the moment and where the Greens are at, what's going on there. Everyone's happy. We're all getting along Good. and we're going to go through the whole shebang. Good. Good. If you want something maybe more fun, equally spicy. <laughs> Come on, man. I encourage you, if you haven't yet, to check out our latest episode on Patreon. If you're already a subscriber, it'll be there in the feed like the rest of our patron-only episodes. But we've got a new episode called Turfed Out. Should we ban lawns? 
which I've been wanting to do for ages. It was extremely fun. It's about anti-lawn discourse, memes, anti-grass, communists, yes. our lawn sexist, etc. It's a good reason to become a, a patron if you're not already. <laughs> Only three bucks and you get to hear us talk about grass for an hour. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty awesome. Not that yeah. grass, the other one. If you can't be a patron or you already are and you want to do even more for us, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen to this show on. That really helps spread the word, gets us some attention, builds some heat. We love it. Makes attention. us go viral. We love attention. Um, and subscribe to us on YouTube as well. We're on all the socials at Serious Danger AU. Well, I heard it on the radio And I saw it on the television Back in 1988, all those talking politicians But promises can disappear, just like writing in the sand Well, Emerald, Thursday was racist Christmas, Australia Day, as you called it before Because <laughs> you love it, it. <laughs> Yeah, I refuse to call it anything else Fair enough that's cancel culture How was your, how was your invasion <laughs> day? What happened? What did you do? It was really hot um, went to the rally normally because the yeah the greens in um, Brisbane me and do the the barbecue normally I'd be like chopping fruit or something but I this year just went to the rally and it was probably the hottest rally that I can remember in my entire life uh, heat wise or because of the political heat uh, <laughs> and calls uh, for justice heat, heat wise it was really really hot and sunny okay yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> how were people talking about the Indigenous Voice to Parliament and treaty mm. at the rally? Did that come up, I assume, in speeches? God, yeah, because that was I was really trying to listen very hard, which was difficult because the sound was not great in the park. So, Same in, in Nam, actually, yeah, yeah, quite bad sound system there. Very annoying. Yeah, it was really hard to hear. Um, but and I was getting my f- friend Reed standing next to me to like tell me what people were saying because he's better at listening to things than I am. And Good as I know. understand, yeah, it was, absolutely. There were people who stood up and were like, "Fuck the voice." Um, vote no, don't fall for this bullshit, we deserve better. A lot of people saying that. Then there were also people, including people who had organised the rally and our rally was, as I think the one in Nam was, was as well, advertised using the slogans like treaty before voice. Yeah. But then Uncle Coco, who is, yeah, absolutely one of the organisers, stood up and was like, we have a chance to get this recognition get constitutional recognition and, you know, get a voice for um, for blackfellas and we need to take it, mm. even though, yeah, obviously we need to push for treaty as well. But it's, yes, yeah, so it's really, it was hard to tell, like definitely mixed. Yeah. I mean, I think the organisers of the NAM rally got up at one point sort of saying this is not a no rally yeah. despite what the media will tell you. Yes, We're exactly. not here to tell you how to vote. We're here to uh, reassert and draw attention to our sovereignty and to, again, um, increase the calls for treaty. And I, and I suppose you could characterise a lot of it as more an emphasis, emphasis for focus on celebration of dedication to treaty um, mm. and I suppose a scepticism towards voice from some speakers, mm. particularly if that distracts from or in some ways jeopardises the calls for treaty as they saw yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I mean, some people went further. <laughs> Gary Foley, uh, who is always great to speak at rallies, um, long-time radical revolutionary socialist uh, speaker and black thinker, one of the founders of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy, mm. spoke in Nam, and he said, beware of black bourgeoisie trying to sell you a referendum, trying to sell you a shonky proposition called The Voice. I want you to think. Think before you vote. Make sure you're not being manoeuvred into a position of being complicit in the latest of a long line of cosmetic bullshit measures that will change nothing in the way of justice for Aboriginal people. Mm. I think he called it lipstick on a pig. He even suggested maybe people could spoil their ballot in the referendum and maybe just write land rights now instead of yes or no when mm. uh, the vote comes around. Our good friend Lydia Thorpe was uh, a speaker, rock star reception, I'd say. A lot of love for yeah. Lydia Thorpe there. That's well deserved. This is a war! <laughs> We need peace. We're sick of dying. We're sick of seeing our children taken. We're sick of seeing our men demonised. And we're sick of the racism in this country 
from the federal parliament poison chalice that it is, right through to the everyday streets that we walk down. We have to rid racism and heal this country, bring everyone together through a sovereign treaty. She said this is a war and she also sort of, I guess, was pushing back the, the idea of an advisory role, particularly, and pretty um, critical about that. But I thought it was worth talking through. We obviously touched on this with Bo Spear in last week's episode about the referendum and about the fact that these rallies were, you know, um, organising around the idea of treaty before voice. But there's also been a bunch of developments with the Greens' position on the voice this week and um, a little bit more flesh on the bones as to what the voice might actually be or what the government is proposing. So we thought it was worth sort of chatting through and taking the time to spend this week's episode talking about the voice. But we should have a disclaimer. Let's have like a cool alert sound or something in here, Michael. Just disclaimer, <laughs> white person disclaimer, white person disclaimer. We're both white. You're white. Is that right, Emerald? Yes. I'm also white. And we want to just acknowledge that as we go through this conversation. And I think, you know, this is not the last thing we will say. This will be a massive political story that will um, unfold over the course of the year. We're really keen to have more First Nations people on the show to talk about it, including members of the Greens First Nation Network or the Black Greens. And I think for this conversation, I just want to say there's a bunch of stuff we don't know. We're still learning. You know, talking through it is valuable, I think, and just asking a few questions, even if we don't know to figure out the answers here between us. Um, I think it's worth sort of asking those questions and thinking about because, you know, whatever you think of the process, if we mm. change the Australian Constitution, fucking everyone gets that vote, right? Like we're all going to have to end up going into um, the ballot box and the ballot box, the booth, and making a decision whether yes or no, or whether we spoil a ballot or whatever, like that mm. is something that's going to affect all voters, right? Funny, because how you pitched it to me, Tom, was I'm sick of hearing all these <laughs> Aboriginal people talk about the referendum. Yes. I, mm -hmm. as a white man, should get to have my say. So that's my understanding of, of this. But <laughs> okay, sure, we, yeah. we need to talk again about off-mic conversations <laughs> and bringing that toxicity on air. <laughs> Let's work through those issues. Yeah, yeah, oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is your general vibe on The Voice thus far? How are you feeling? What do you make of it? Do you feel like you know which way you'd vote on the question when the referendum happens, Emerald? Mm. What's your vibe? I actually, to be honest, hadn't really thought about how I'm going to vote because that's not generally how I think about my engagement in political processes, if that makes sense. Like to me, the way I vote is the least important thing that I do. Um, but, yeah, thinking about it, I think like yesterday or today, I was like, I don't know how I'll vote. I actually, yeah, I actually don't know. I do think because I have that position, I think I've said this to you also off mic, about like I hate it when we just get sucked into responding to, reacting to other parties' positions other groups' kind of framing of issues instead of focusing on our thing. And that's what I think that a lot of people are trying to do and certainly like I've seen Lydia trying to do is talk about, well, this is what the Greens have put forward. This is what Blackfellas have been calling for. Um, why are we being asked whether we're going to campaign for a Labor initiative? That's mm -hmm. not our our role. Our role is to push for what we want. And like I get, yeah, like I understand we'll have to kind of, you know, individual people will have to take a, a position on how they vote in the referendum and the Greens have a vote on certain things on legislation in, in Parliament, whether or not it is incumbent on the Greens to take and campaign on a particular position on how people vote in the referendum, I'm honestly still unsettled on that. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, yes, I might have a different view on that, but I think that mm. might come out through the course of the conversation. Mm. But I think that's totally fine if you don't know. Apparently, Australia is not too sure at the yeah, moment either. I'm getting less just, sure. I'm getting less As sure. As time goes on. Not surprised. Me too. This week, Nine Fairfax published a resolve poll. It was about 3,618 people, so it's like a decent poll size mm. for these kind of regular polls, about their thoughts on the voice referendum. Now, I will say, again, this is still very early on, and I think some of the hand-wringing about, oh, there's not enough detail, people don't know enough stuff, it, it is a little bit like, well, it's still January and the yes and no campaigns haven't launched. There will be a massive government education campaign. We'll have this debate play out. We still don't have a date of when we're actually going to the polls for this referendum. So to me, it's still pretty early days. But anyway, that poll found that 60% of voters were in favour if they were opposed with just a straight yes, no um, 
uh, question on this particular voice. That was down from 64% in September. Um, that was still a majority of people in a majority of states, which remember that is the double majority you need to meet in order to get a referendum changed through and to change the constitution. Support for the general idea of the voice, though, had fallen from 53% to 47%. So we're not in a sort of yes, no binary. Mm. Actually, support weakens a, a fair bit. Now, a lot of that has gone to not sure. The the no vote yeah. increased by like 1%, I think, but most people had moved into the you know still not sure category. So that's yeah. sort of where it's going. Mm. And we'll discuss how that party support like it's how so that support breaks hey, down along party yeah. lines in a little bit because that is very interesting. Yes. But when asked about their awareness of the voice, 63% of all voters said they'd heard of it but didn't understand it. 23% said they'd never heard of it, which is yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah. And just 13% they understood it and were confident explaining it to someone else. Mm-hmm. The group of voters who were most confident in their understanding about the voice. Take a guess. <laughs> Take a guess. Was the old Greens voters. <sighs> Nineteen like percent of Greens voters apparently feeling like I got this. I can do this. Here <laughs> yeah. is my slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Miss. Yes, I know. Yes, I can. I know. I did the reading. <laughs> um, you're a Greens voter, Emerald. Do you feel mm. confident in explaining what the Indigenous Voice to Parliament is? Probably not. No. Do you? I do now because I spent about four hours yeah. also looking it up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I just went to the website, but. Yeah, the question of, of, of what it is and the details certainly are um, are still a mystery to a lot of people. Now, yeah. you know, if you want to research it, I think I think that information is definitely there. Mm. But there's a big difference between and, and the Albanese has been criticised for this, saying, "Oh, there's a report. Go read the report. Go read this yeah. 250 report page report." And you go, "No, come on, man. You need to be able to express in a succinct way. You need to do politics and convince mm. people of the basic." in principle, call to action that you're asking for if you want this to succeed. Yeah. I think the lack of detail um, charges have come from some quarters and I think some of it is very much in bad faith. I think, yeah, I but, agree. Yes. But there's a big difference between, you know, there's detail that exists in an academic elite circle of place mm. and we haven't, you know, actively engaged with people and explained what we're talking about here. And I also yeah. think that's fine because the Yes No campaigns haven't launched and we've still got quite a while before we actually go to the polls. Well, yeah, but also the fact that like a, a lot of the kind of um, the discourse that I've seen or like the articles when they've been discussing people who are critical of the the voice or maybe leaning towards a vote no campaign, they only talk about their like their criticism is there's a lack of detail and that's mm. bullshit. It's like that's not the only criticism, which obviously we'll get into. I think people are recognising a little bit more. Maybe even just sure. as of this week. Yes. The bad faith one is Peter Dutton saying there's no detail. And yeah. I, I don't know if any journalists have said, have you read uh, Have you read a report from Marshall yeah. Langton and Tom Carver about this? You were in Cabinet when you were being briefed about this. You were in government in 2017 when the first Ulrich Statement of the Heart came through. What kind of effort have you made here? Or are you just getting political advantage by saying there's no detail? Someone needs to explain it to me. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Let's run through it real quick. Real quick. Sorry? Real quick. Okay. Real quick. <laughs> The idea of a voice was introduced to public debate 2017. You got the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which mm. clearly states, we call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. The statement also calls for a Makarata Commission to oversee a process of agreement making and truth telling. I.e. treaty. I.e. treaty. So the order is voice, treaty, truth, according to the Uluru Statement as laid out. Mm. Labor has said we're going to implement the Uluru Statement in full and we're going to start with the referendum on enshrining the voice in the Constitution and we've been getting a little bit more meat on the bones as to what it is. Now, the big yeah. thing is we, the referendum is about the in-principle idea of having a voice and the details will be legislated by parliament. Mm. So there is a government website about the voice, which I didn't know until yesterday, so that is oh, worth having a look at with some okay. – <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> we'll link to that in the show notes. But here's, here's the basic uh, overview. The voice, according to the government, the voice will be an independent representative advisory body for First Nations people. It will provide a permanent means to advise the Australian Parliament and government on the views of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on matters that affect them. There are a set of principles that describe how the voice will work. They were agreed to by the First Nations Referendum Working Group. The voice is a body that will provide independent advice to Parliament and government, be chosen by First Nations people based on the wishes of local communities, be representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities, be empowering, community-led, inclusive, respectful, culturally informed, and gender balanced, and includes youth. <laughs> Such a weird way to phrase youth. that. But yeah. Yeah. It will be accountable and transparent. It will work alongside existing organisations and traditional structures. 
the voice will not have a program delivery function or a veto power. Or a veto power. The structure and the role of the voice will be decided by parliament through legislation with members to be chosen by First Nations people. And I think it's also important to just underline the nature of enshrining this in the constitution does mean that it is somewhat more permanent than previous advisory bodies. And I think that is a point that is sometimes skipped over by some critics of this voice, particularly like, oh, we've had lots of advisory bodies. And again, I appreciate the scepticism, but it's important to underline once the constitution says this body has to exist, that does mean that it is extremely difficult to get rid of or abolish like the Howard government did with ATSIC, for example, in the early 2000s. The critique of previous advisory bodies I would say is not that they can be easily abolished, even though that is a concern that a future government could do that. It's that they don't result in any meaningful change because they simply advise and the government of the day says, great, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to continue locking up 10-year-old Aboriginal kids. Um, And thank you very much. New coal and gas. (laughs) And that is that is a perfect that is a really uh, a a very strong critique that that I think is definitely worth considering and Sometimes it's hard to yeah, hear clear answers to that or, or decent arguments against it. But I think, again, we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a mm. sec too. Um, also, filling out the picture a little bit, so Marsha Langton and Tom Karma wrote this report, like some basic design principles of what the voice might look like, and they recommended. So this, this isn't necessarily what's going to happen, but these are the kind of things that might go into a legislation for the voice if it comes about. It would look like a 24-member panel with gender parity two members from each state, the ACT, Northern Territory and the Torres Strait, plus five members representing remote communities and one representing Torres Strait Islanders living on the mainland. Local and regional voice groups would provide input to the national body and there'd be Mm. two advisory panels would be established specifically to focus on disability matters and youth. Okay. The general principle in practice, ideas around health, education, or housing for Indigenous communities would be directly informed by the views of the people the policy was being designed for. So, yeah, laying out that kind of like what the actual makeup would look like, how big it would be, et cetera, is is kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't don't know how I feel about 24 people, whether I think that's really small or or really big or what have you. I also have some Mm. questions about, so gender parity, so that means that what each state would have a male and a female representative, I suppose. Well, does it, or does it just mean overall on the board? I guess overall, I guess across the whole thing, which also, yeah, presumably. But how does that work with democracy in terms of like that? Like it's different. A political party having quotas for the candidates they put forward. It's it's a different matter for a body to say we need X number of people of this gender and X number mm. of people of that gender, and therefore that affects the number of people who can. Stand, I guess. Mm, I, I guess so. I yeah. I mean, do you want to get into a quotas discussion or? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Well, what if what if the community want to? There are two amazing female candidates, and but they don't. Yeah, I don't know. That's yeah. um. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, there it does seem to be this very messy. And again, whiteness not qualified to talk about the intersection between our common understandings of democracy and representative democracy and our local communities tradition cultural protocols, for example, you know, the, the way that um, mm. elders in certain First Nations communities are uh, given authority in their community yeah. by, by course of tradition is they're not necessarily voted into that position, but there is a yeah. level of community consent to give them that authority, right? So, yeah. again, that's a that's a rabbit hole that I'm not at all qualified to enter into, but it's an interesting kind of wrinkle, I suppose, in, in what we think about. Mm. But I suppose, and again, we'll come back to the critique of the body not being able to do anything, but the general idea that we're often heard about in leftist circles, nothing about us without us, black-led mm-hmm. solutions, et cetera, et cetera. Do you see that sort of being represented in this general idea of the voice being enshrined in the constitution? Barely. I think really? barely because the fact that they're saying it specifically does not have a program delivery function or a veto power, to me, nothing about us without us, like that means involved not just in consultation but in delivery. Mm. Right. Yeah. And a serious power over the decision-making power. Right, Right. okay. So without the veto power, of course, it can be ignored, advice can be provided to parliament or the government, and the government can say, thank you very much, voice, but we good. Mm. Yeah. So uh, the response to that from or the defence of that from people like Anthony Albanese is like, oh, it would have to be a very brave government to ignore 
the advice recommended to it by the voice, right? This is what he was saying, like as if that would ever happen. And this is when my skepticism does come in because we know that this fucking happens all the time. In fact, it happened when the Uluru Statement from the Heart was delivered, the coalition government immediately rejected it out of hand. Governments ignore and don't pursue the recommendations of royal commissions, of Senate inquiries, of calls from community groups, um, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, all the fucking time. And the nature of politics suggests to us that when a body hands down these, you know, recommendations, if it's not politically expedient or not a priority or it's not going to win them or co- or it is, will cost them some substantial votes in their view, they will kick it to the curb. Yeah. I'm actually surprised by, like, that evokes such a visceral reaction in me because <laughs> I'm like, wow, Labor governments must be really fucking brave then. <laughs> 90% of what they do is ignoring all the evidence, all the submissions, all the consultation, every advisory body, every expert, all the evidence telling them do something else. Like particularly I'm thinking about raising the age, for example. Like right. the support for raising the age to at least 14 years old, age of criminal responsibility, is like across every fucking profession and like right. so many First Nations groups and your own fucking party. Like Labor's own members will set policies that Labor doesn't. So, like, yeah, they're brave enough to ignore even their <laughs> own members and all of the unions who back them, all of the NGOs who back them. Like, yeah, okay, I, maybe this is just Anthony Albanese's way of saying what a fucking brave government he has for continually ignoring evidence and, like, every advisory body that they've ever pretended to consult on anything. That is the stupidest thing I've ever fucking heard. I'm sorry. <laughs> So I suppose defenders of the voice would say that the the if you got Australia to agree to have a voice and then produces this body, which then produces recommendations, they would argue the political force of that or the 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 level of legitimacy that that body would have would be more effective and have more place more political pressure on a government to act on certain issues than other previous bodies or disparate bodies or bodies that haven't that have previously existed simply didn't have. No. Nope. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I just don't buy it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. I also think there's, there was one objection to what The Voice would talk about that I think is another bad faith argument from the likes of Peter Dutton saying, but everything affects First Nations people. I mean, what about defence? I mean, Aboriginal people live in Australia, they were, what about defence and education, et cetera, et cetera, which yeah. is to me a pretty – a juvenile attempt. It's like, you know what we're fucking talking about, man. You know the issues that are specific to and that the directly affect and that have been absolutely shitty for First Nations people in this country, particularly, you know, questions that only affect them when it comes to questions about land rights and sovereignty and a path towards treaty, which we expect the voice to play a role mm-hmm. in. But also, you know, you know what we're fucking talking about when we're talking about, you know, the way that First Nations people interact and are fucking oppressed by a horrific criminal justice system, housing, education, um, cultural rights, et cetera, et cetera. Like I, I, that, that, that argument against the voice being like, oh, but they're just citizens like everybody else and it affects everyone. It's like, fuck off, man. You, you know what's going on. I haven't seen that argument. I do think it, there's an interesting, I mean, it is interesting though because it's like how do they pick and choose what they consult First Nations people on? I, I actually hadn't thought about this aspect of it and, yes, I'm learning about the voice that it would only be consulted on certain things. Yeah. I mean, that is a bit sus. <laughs> really? Yes. Like if you're We'd- saying a First Nations voice, in, like to me that's a voice in a say in how decisions are made in this country and decisions in this country are made by government at the behest of their corporate donors, um, but theoretically by parliament and government. Like- but we, we have an, a Department for Aboriginal Affairs. You know, we have programs that are exclusively for First Nations people. Yeah. Uh, land rights legislation, native title law. Like there is, there is a whole section of Australian law and society that is exclusively for Aboriginal people that has been, you know, very poorly but mm-hmm. attempted to set up to do something about the – the general well-being. I mean, as, as as Langton and Karma put it, the social, spiritual, and economic well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. But how's that working out for us? Like, we have these, yeah, we have like the Department of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Partnerships, and it's similar to I think when we've had like a um, Minister for Youth, for example, 
yeah. you're like, what do you actually do? What do you, because <laughs> particularly when it was Richard Colbeck, the 65 well, year yeah. old guy. <laughs> but I mean, theoretically, it's like, okay, maybe, yes, you would look at how you, how every decision made across the whole of government affects young people or how it affects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. But that's not how it ends up working. They're like, oh, no, no, no. It's just like, how do we work with Aboriginal businesses and um, hold youth roundtables? Uh, you sure. Know? No, that's that's about the efficacy, which is which is totally fine. I'm just saying that I I feel like as a country, as a as a in our political debate, we were able to identify the issues and the kind of bills that would go before a parliament that would obviously require the consent and the consultation of the voice of parliament. Why doesn't everything require that though? <laughs> I, I'm. This is yeah. This is new. I don't understand. I don't know. Like there are so you're saying that it's only things that would disproportionately impact. First Nations people, but surely, arguably, I actually can't think of very many things, very many decisions that are made by government that don't impact First Nations people in a different way because the impacts of colonization are so broad reaching, like mm. that they do, yeah, they reach across every fucking aspect of, of our lives. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a good example, but I can't right now. Mm. <laughs> I think another point on the, uh, you know, the efficacy uh, the idea that the voice won't do much is like thinking about, okay, what would be different if we'd had a voice? So mm-hmm. would the Northern Territory intervention have gone ahead if we had a First Nations mm-hmm. voice to Parliament? And what's interesting about that is that Marsha Langton and Noel Pearson, massive proponents of the voice to Parliament, were like pretty much backers of the Northern Territory inter- intervention, thought it was a good so thing. interesting. And they're generally conservative <laughs> people. And so yeah. whether that would happen. If we had a, a First Nations voice to parliament, would all the ro- the recommendations from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in mm. Custody have been implemented throughout the 90s and uh, and ever since that was handed down in the early 90s? I mean, that's right. that's the question. Um, and I, I assume that supporters of the voice would say yes or would like to say yes, but I haven't seen them be particularly talked about that or like looking at a historical example and explaining how the voice would work in relation to that I thought feels like a an area still to be explored yeah and what was interesting this week with the that resolve poll they asked voters last September actually whether they believed the voice could close the gap 33 percent thought thought this was likely while 43 percent thought it unlikely so again even people might mm. be broadly uh supportive of the idea of the voice the cynicism about <laughs> government and doing things is still quite strong in the community, right? You know what I think is an interesting way to think about this? Like we 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 have the First Nations Network in the Australian Greens um, and similarly a lot of the, maybe all of the state and territory member bodies have a Black Greens body. And, yeah, like the First Nations Network has a seat on National Council in the Australian Greens and as of relatively recently, like within the last couple of years, has has voting rights on National Council. So. Like it's kind of a similar idea, right? It's an advisory body to how the party makes decisions. And similarly, I think that Labor has a um, some sort of First Nations network in the party. I don't know exactly what rights they have. Who knows what the LNP have? But but I think even, yeah, it, I would look at the way that Labor, for example, deals with having a First Nations advisory body in their own party and they mm. can have their say and they have input and they might even set the policy but when it comes down to it, nothing fucking happens. Who, God knows what the LNP, I mean, they're racist, so of course they're not going to do what, what it <laughs> says. But, like, even Labor and government, I'm like, maybe, yeah, the Greens are at least taking the First Nations Network's input on our policy seriously. They set our policy, and that's mm. why we're in this position on The Voice. Um, but even so, like, there's not a whole lot of respect across the party, it seems, for that, like, carefully... Um, developed position and, and policy from the First Nations Network within the Greens. So mm. I'm just like, uh, yeah, I think that's where my scepticism comes from when we talk about any kind of advisory body like that. Like even when they have a vote, it's hard to get mm. shit done. Okay, so the next steps for this process is the referendum legislation needs to be passed by Parliament. So, so the, the both houses need to pass it in order for it to the question actually be put to the people. 
the referendum question and what the actual constitutional change itself is apparently going to be debated in Parliament in March. Okay. The question is going to be something like, do you support an alteration to the constitution that establishes an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice? So mm-hmm. again, you know, all the detail is dealt with in the campaign. The question mm-hmm. is like, are you for or against the voice? The yes and no campaigns won't be receiving public funding. There'll be a public fun- publicly funded neutral education campaign about what the voice is mm-hmm. from the government and the referendum process. Yeah. The yes no campaigns are set to launch in February. The yes campaign is going to launch with a week of action, oh. including door knocking, which is weird because I don't, I don't think door knocking the works. Week of action. But- <laughs> and community barbecues with the aim of promoting dialogue about the issue. And there's also going to be a big advertising campaign. Mm. Um, the fundraisers for the Yes campaigners are getting going, including some, like the head of West Farmers, I think, and Mark fucking Texter from the polling company is involved in the Yes campaign, which makes me okay. not feel not good. And look, if you had to guess right now, it's probably likely that it won't get up. Okay, like the odds are really stacked against any referendum being getting being voted yes by by the Australian people. People probably know the stats. Forty four referendum attempts, only eight have been successful. You got to get a majority of the population and a majority of the states. Uh, no successful referendum has been successful without bipartisan support. Um, mm. And also, I've been doing a bit of research about the history of referendum in Australia because I'm very cool, and I'm doing a show about this. Tickets on sale now. Um, <laughs> Just profiting off uh, um, Indigenous issue. That's interesting. Cha ching, you know. Pay the rent. Um, <laughs> a, most, almost all the successful referendum, they haven't even changed that much. Like most, most of them mm. were but cementing in uh, the status quo, basically like pre-existing um, status quo, or were quite minor changes. And I think you would say that this establishment of a voice to parliament is a reasonably large change um, and a disruption of the status quo. We don't have bipartisan support. We know the Nationals have said they're not going to support it. And actually, we didn't talk about this. Over the Christmas break, did you hear that guy, Andrew G, just quit the Nationals over this particular no. issue? Yeah. I was obviously switched off enough to miss that. Yeah, I remember my dad mentioning or something while I was in, at home for Christmas. But, yes, he's, he's just walked away from the party saying no because um, oh, the Nationals yes. said no voice. Yeah, yeah. Liberal Party still a bit of a question mark. Do you think there's any chance that Peter Dutton's Liberal Party is going to uh, support <laughs> the voice of Parliament or give his MPs a conscience vote on it, or what do you think? Maybe a conscience vote. Yeah, that's probably likely. I mean, also the Liberals could vote for the referendum, like to get that passed through or whatever, put the question to the people, but then campaign for a no vote. That's what obviously the Howard government did yeah. with the, with the Republic referendum. So they can be on board the idea of the referendum happening, and mm. you know they can't do much about that. Great campaigning opportunity for them. <laughs> And we'll probably, yes, I mean, get a lot of um, airtime, I suppose, and we may see political advantage in, in campaigning against it. Which is fucking gross, by the way. Like, just to be like, yes. yeah, awful. Which is, yes, again, a tricky position if if someone is on the left is voting the no for lefty mm. reasons. You know, you do need to contend with the fact that you'll be voting the same as the racists, as Bo Spearman put it last week. Yeah. Dutton said, I want to make sure that those voices that have the ability to make the changes and the practical outcomes and the improvements for kids and women and families on the ground, that's the voice that I want to hear. That is a (laughs) weird way to put it. For kids and women and families on the ground. God, that's right. Remember when shout the out, shout out to all to, the kids and women kids and families, and families on the ground. <laughs> when they were trying to be the family party, maybe they're still that's still in the messaging guide somewhere. We love to family. And he's also been throwing out this idea that the government should legislate a model, a proposed model. So, so mm. you know, at the moment the government's saying, okay, we get the referendum to say, yes, we need the voice, and then we'll legislate afterwards. At Dutton saying, we need to see a model, we need to see a draft bill, which I do think is, again, bad faith posturing a little bit and is could be seen to be an attempt to sink the referendum in the same way that the Republic referendum was sunk over the disagreements on the model. I mean, some people mm. voted no on the model on the republic thing sincerely thinking that there would be another referendum in the next couple of years with a different model they they did not there was quite a a general like a no and uh kind of vote was quite popular at the time this land was never given up this land was never bought and sold the planting of the union jet never changed our law and all that brings us to the position of, as Al- Anthony Albanese puts it, the Greens political party. GPP. On the voice to parliament. Emerald, what is the Greens position on the voice? We <laughs> want a treaty. We want truth, treaty, voice. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah. 
a vo- just this proposal for a voice in the constitution as is without a treaty is inadequate and doesn't adequately recognize sovereignty of first nations people i would say right do you think that was that was succinctly summarized do you think the party's done a good job of communicating that over the past couple of months look i know you are probably thinking no like i think a lot of people would say no it's been very confusing and often i would be the first to say like to criticize green's messaging when i think it's confusing <laughs> but I do think that there has been a concerted effort externally to confuse the Greens message on this. And I think it's been, it's, yeah, it would be much clearer if we didn't have an extremely hostile media. Right. Yeah. Look, yeah, as we go through this, you know, again, remember where I'm coming from. I'm very sympathetic to the uh, left wing critiques of the voice, much more receptive to the likes of uh, Lydia Thorpe and other radicals have a whole bunch of reservations, et cetera, et cetera. But I think putting this together, I, f- I think you could definitely make the case that it's been hard to follow over time, mm-hmm. over, over a variety of different statements coming from either Adam as leader or the official Greens Party position and Lydia's position on certain things. And, and all I want, and I'm totally up for hearing arguments against stuff, but I just a cohesive, consistent argument talking about this kind of stuff, um, mm-hmm. it's been hard to keep track of. But totally take because- your point. There is a there is a uh, hostile media environment yeah. around this stuff, and clearly, nine fair facts get a lot of clicks on Lydia Thorpe articles because yes, holy shit, they they'll run fucking anything. Them. <laughs> but, so is that because you want a clear position on how people should vote in this referendum? I definitely think the Greens need to have a clear position yeah. on how people should vote on this referendum. Yes. Okay. And I think what is inconsistent or contradictory is the idea that they. That is that we do have a position on that, but then also we're not committing or that we would abstain or what have you. I think I think once you put it all together, it looks like not, not everything here flows from one to the next. But okay. I definitely think that a referendum is a massive political opportunity and to be a growing big, you know, wanting to be a mass political party in Australia in 2023, people should know where you stand on on this particular question. I think that's, mm. that's It's great. interesting because, I mean, when you think about the plebiscite, which is the the um, closest parallel in our lifetimes or like that I can remember, mm. it was very like we don't want a plebiscite, fuck a plebiscite, fuck, fuck a plebiscite, and then switched into vote yes. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Which mm. which could well be it. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I, we'll get to it, but I think where this is going could be yeah, way less dramatic than yeah. <laughs> all the naysayers might, might suggest. But yeah. Before the election, at the end of April, Adam Bant released a statement saying this. He said, let me be clear. He did, he did an Obama. Let, me be, <laughs> let me be clear. The Greens were the first party to support the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full, and we still do. This land always was First Nations land. It always will be, and we all need to take steps to ensure First Nations justice. The Greens have a strong First Nations network, which was, has underscored the value of the order of truth-telling treaty and voice to make sure the change is lasting and meaningful. Victoria's mm. Labor government is already proceeding with truth and treaty. We need progress nationally too. We may only get one chance at a referendum to enshrine mm. a voice to parliament in the constitution. It cannot fail. Our policy is to improve, not block vital legislation. And so in balance of power, we'd work with the next government to further truth, treaty and voice. We need to kick liberals out. The Greens will work with the next government to improve First Nations rights, set up a truth and justice commission and begin steps towards a treaty. Mm. Again. Supporting the law state from the heart with a different order, truth, treaty, yeah. and voice. That's and Lydia Thorpe has previously said she backs that. But then also it seems to me she has also critiqued the substance of the voice. I mean, she has said that this idea would be a waste of money, it's a wasted exercise. You don't need a referendum to have a treaty. She seems to be critical of the idea of just a purely advisory body mm. and its potential negative impact on, as you mentioned, First Nations sovereignty and the prospects of a treaty, hence the, the calls at the rally this year, treaty mm. before voice. So I suppose I hear the the understanding of of this order and the explanation as to why treaty comes first, truth of treaty comes first before voice. But I, I just I'm not sure whether that translates automatically into a no vote on the referendum this year. Mm. Okay, so you can say yes, we believe in treaty. Treaty is really important. We're putting the emphasis of that. We're campaigning around that. But on you know August the fifth, Australia is going to the polls, and unless there's a treaty before that date. We're going to vote no to the voice. Is that is that what sort of follows, or is or am I not? I reading don't that think right? necessarily. Yeah, that's it's true that that is unclear to me. Yes, and yes, as as I say, I think that's that's a problem. Um, I'll mm. get to why. 
Two weeks ago, there was a story about the First Nations Network, the Black Greens, coming to a position position about The Voice. So, again, as you said, this is the advisory group within the party. Uh, they've laid out their conditions for supporting The Voice to Parliament, saying it must be subject to treaty negotiations with the government. Pending further negotiations with the government, the Greens are holding out on explicitly supporting the looming referendum, wanting further progress on all three elements outlined in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Yeah. Janara Grengering, former Serious Danger coast, uh, guest, yeah. National co-convener of the Greens First Nation Network, which informs the party's policy on Indigenous matters, called on the government to include discussion of Indigenous sovereignty in the voice referendum. My view is the voice, as recognised in the Constitution, will not provide what First Nations people have been asking for for a long time. Last week, Lydia Thorpe told the nine newspapers, we don't support a no campaign, we don't support a yes campaign, until we see Labor action those recommendations that saves our people's lives and provides a guarantee that our sovereignty won't be ceded. Green Green said the Greens MPs would settle their final position, but she welcomed her party continuing right to the end of the negotiating path. Our view is a voice should be established. It's the way in which it's done. It has to be done properly. Our view as the Black Greens is we'd want our party to negotiate this as much as possible uh, to get the best outcome for people saying our sovereignty is the most important thing for us. Janara also said there's not a lot of detail about the voice. It makes it mm. difficult to vote for something you don't know about, which I think we addressed before in regards to the detail. To me, I was like, well, this isn't news. It's maybe just the best summary of the Greens' position that I'd seen today. Right. But I, su- I suppose I still have questions about what, so what does it look like for progress on treaty to be uh, established in, in regards to, in, in that if you're getting the Green support for the referendum legislation to go ahead on The Voice, what guarantees are we looking for to ensure that we're saying that treaty is being progressed. Because certainly defenders of and supporters of The Voice are saying that The Voice is a first step on the way to treaty. The Voice doesn't jeopardise treaty. And in fact, mm. in, organized, in order to negotiate a treaty, a body very much like The Voice would need to be established and created. Mm. Yeah. I. This is where I get stuck is determining whether The Voice, as it's currently being proposed, is like a net is it a negative or it yeah impedes our ability to achieve progress on those other elements of the Uluru statement being truth and um treaty in particular and and i know there are kind of complex arguments about that around sovereignty etc but i i think what were you saying yeah what does that mean then when it comes to a voice being established oh what what would progress on treaty look like surely it's a time bound mm. commitment to start treaty negotiations. Like I wonder if, yeah, that would include something like being committed in Victoria and Queensland and I'm not sure where else. Mm. Yes. Well, I, again, I don't know a huge amount of the details of the treaty process in Victoria, but, I mean, you've got the First People's Congress of Victoria, which mm. is, you know, a, a advisory legislative body Right. Uh, that was the, you know, that is elected by First Nations people. That's heavily involved in the treaty process. The treaty process involves a substantial amount of um, consultation and dialogues with um, various senior people of all the nations that make up the state of Victoria. But was that established for treaty? Like, because in Queensland, it was like path to treaty was announced, and then there was a yeah, like I think a commission um, established yeah, right. as part of that path to treaty. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, time commitment, that's a pretty good idea. I mean, again, my if I had to guess now, the way this will all shake out is that the Greens will support the, the referendum and mm-hmm. support the Yes campaign and will win some con- – will have made enough noise to win some concessions to get a clear idea of what kind of level of commitment of treaty in a, in a mm-hmm. time frame um, to secure their support. Yeah, and to me – and as well, it's another one – I mean, it reminds me of the climate bill saga – where it's like, well, clearly we're also doing our job as a minor party that holds, you know, balance of power in the Senate at times and is trying to negotiate for a better outcome that more closely reflects our own policy. Mm. And people just who can who continually keep pressing, okay, but is it yes or no on what Labor has put on the table right now? And you're like, well, we're not there yet. We're negotiating for what our members and our First Nations work in this instance have determined is our platform that we have to fight for and that's what people voted for us on that basis so it's like it just makes sense to me to have this position but that's i i acknowledge that's probably a very like hackish and kind of <laughs> I don't know. well i think what complicates that is the nature of a referendum which is literally yes, yes or, or no. no but we're not there yet we don't have the referendum yet. <laughs> yeah we don't have the referendum no but of course yeah. 
And and look, a big part of this is there's nothing else politically happening at the moment, so the yes. media are going bankers around this. It's the but quiet start to a year we've had in in years, for like, a long time. Yes, yeah. But the yes, the presentation of a yes or no binary as the nature of the referendum, you know, it is an easy thing to put to to any politician or political actor or someone, particularly you know, speaking about First Nations rights in this country. Are you yes or or are you no? That is that is the question. That is the way yeah. that um, referendums have, uh, have ended up being. And I and I think clearly, defi- you know, placing making it clear in which camp we sit will have to come for the for the party at some point. Um, and I guess the the critiques of. Uh, some of Lydia's campaigning or this campaigning that we're seeing from some, some some different voices is that they are throwing doubt on the voice proposal or muddying the waters or what have you. I'm not saying this is what I think. I'm just mm. saying that, that is that is a critique. And when you have a yes yeah. or no vote, when it's very hard to get something passed, this is where people's concern comes in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which also I think somewhat, I mean, it, it could be a valid critique, it could be true, but I also am wary of people um, not respecting the intelligence of the Australian public and their ability to understand nuanced conversations. And, like, I think people are capable of, of yeah, of understanding this. But, I mean, they'll be less capable if we get such a fucking binary and, yeah, such a shit, like, discussion in our media. Yes. Some people going into this political debate seem shocked that there is political debate going on. So we had that statement from the Black Greens. Then the South Australian Greens rift. They did their own thing. The South Australian Greens have unanimously agreed to support the referendum and vote yes to enshrining a First Nations voice in the constitution. Um, so that was endorsed by the South Australian First Nations Network as well. So, again, we had some state party differences. Maybe that will um, play mm-hmm. out as well over the year. And then this week we had a story from Nine Fairfax about the Greens' Lydia Thorpe position. Green Senator Lydia Thorpe has cleared the way for a split with her colleagues on the Indigenous voice to Parliament in a formal deal in the party room on Wednesday that gives her free reign to vote against the proposal while others give it their support. The agreement is almost certain to lead to a divided Greens position on the crucial question in a referendum. It's weird. It's it's almost certain. We'll wait and see. At the end of the year, unless Thorpe gains an assurance from the federal government that Indigenous sovereignty will be guaranteed as part of the voice. Mm-hmm. The outcome breaks with the party's usual demand for total discipline when voting on major policy, that's after consensus, but was agreed after an online meeting on Wednesday that ran for several hours to consider Thorpe's criticism of the voice and her call for a treaty with First Australians. Oof. The formal agreement is that Lydia can vote no or abstain on the voice if and when the rest of the party room chooses to support the proposal after the negotiations with the government. If and when the rest of the party room. Is that true? Like this assumption that it's literally only Lydia in party room. That feels this way. I don't think is true. Well, it, I guess it's a, uh, elsewhere in that article, they're saying yes. Very long meeting. Some people are um, sympathetic to Liddy's criticisms of the yeah. of the voice. Yada yada yada. What do, what do you make of this? How do you see this thing playing out? How do I see it playing out? Yeah. Or what, what do you think of this uh, the special deal that, that Liddy's special got deal? there? Does, does does it go against the idea of consensus? If um if I don't know if that's happened if no, Greens yeah. said it as a voted differently to the rest of the party. But I mean, if there's consensus that, that, that this is how you can go ahead, then that's right. consensus, isn't it? And it's also, yeah, I mean, if that means that Lydia is representing the view of the membership of the Victorian Greens and of the First Nations Network, the Black Greens, and other MPs are also doing that for their parties, then that's fine, I guess. But it does well, make it a little... Yeah, it is a little bit sad. I mean, she's our spokesperson on First Nations justice, so like. This is it, man. And I don't know, there's a lot of truisms in politics, a bit bullshit, you know, disunity is death, but it it's, uh, it does seem odd. It seems it, it seems an odd position to take. To um, a party that prides itself on consensus, like- some collective decision-making cannot collectively f- figure this out to the point where our First Nations spokesperson in theory, or potentially maybe at odds with the rest of the party on this stuff, yeah. particularly when you look at the membership, right? So the Resolve poll found that Green vo- Greens mm-hmm. voters were strongly in favour of The Voice, in fact, more than Labor voters, Yeah. according to this poll. 87% of them saying they would vote yes in the referendum-style question compared to 72% of Labor voters, 38% of Coalition voters. Just 7% of Greens voters said that they would definitely or probably vote mm-hmm. no. The rest are in undecided. That really, yeah, this poll did make me, um, it shook me a little bit. It was like, a, I was like, that's interesting. Yes. 
Yeah. I mean, the, I see this stuff and I'm like, well, this feels like something that should be should be put to the membership. We have modern technology. We have secure voting systems. Mm. Um, you know, we run surveys of the membership to get people's opinions. There's, you know, not as many of us as other parties, so it should be a lot easier to do. <laughs> Um, it feels like something that that should be happening on a regular basis. Like the, the the federal body on this kind of stuff, on massive national issues that are playing out in a big way, should for their own information, um, I think, be open to polling the membership. Do you think? Quite possibly, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah. And what what about the democratic legitimacy of that? I mean, I mean, I know we have the First Nations Network. Well, I know that there is yeah. a there is a totally different interplay between our traditional notions of democracy and you know, our ability to try and decolonize our party, to try and recognize historical wrongs, to mm. merely compete with the fact that First Nations people are outnumbered in this country. I mean, again, but, yeah. Uh, what do you think of that? Isn't that the irony, right? That it's like <laughs> we're talking about the role that a voice to a decision making body, an Indigenous voice could make could could play. And then we're talking about how when we have our own Indigenous advisory body in the Australian Greens and they come up with a position that maybe we don't like so much or the white membership, largely white membership, doesn't like so much, then we go go back to the white membership and ask them again so that we can justify overruling that Black Greens um, decision or position. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then what if the Black Greens are, at least according to opinion polls and take them with a grain of salt, you know, reasonably, at least according to these opinion polls, out of step with other First Nations people. I mean, particularly if if the calls are, if are framed in like this is what black fellows want, this is what black people want, this is what Aboriginal people want or do or don't want, and then we see opinion polls. I mean, one's from Reconciliation Australia, so again, grain of salt, but they, they have support for the voice at 86% amongst Indigenous Australians. Uluru Dialogue has it at uh, 80% as well. They just released a poll this week, um, 80% for, 10% unsure, 10% opposed. That was 300 people too, so that's a little bit, you know, well, TBC. Yeah. But, you know, I I think you can confidently say that amongst most First Nations people in this country, there is a majority support for The Voice at this stage. Which, But which are we change. claiming to represent the views of all First Nations people, a majority of First Nations people, or Black Greens, like our values, our party's values, which include First Nations justice as determined by, yeah, like our, our membership? Hmm. Don't know. I think I think we know, we are going long, but I really I do really want to get mm. to these last two points. I think it's really okay. important. Go on, particularly around the question of the voice and its impact on sovereignty. So we've heard Lydia say that she has reservations because entrenching subservience in the constitution is gammon. She says First Nations people are and always will be sovereign people. And this week she said it would take a lot for me to change my personal and long held view that I don't think First Nations justice will come from being written into the colonizers' constitution. Mm. Labor has asserted throughout negotiations that sovereignty isn't impacted. That's not enough. It needs to be explicit. Mm. Do, do you have an understanding of like of, of do you feel like you know what what that means, what Lydia is referring to there? And I guess more broadly, what is the idea of First Nations sovereignty? What do we mean when we talk about that? Sovereignty never ceded. Well, that they're was and is an established, like, I guess, First Nations state or collection of, you know, governing bodies um, that lived and ran this country mm. for many, many years and that that sovereignty was not ceded upon British invasion is kind of my understanding. Yes. And that, yeah, and and by consequence that the British have a responsibility to negotiate with First Nations people on an equal basis as so, as a sovereign people, which they never yes. did. They never did, yes. And I but I and I think it's also important to point like Aboriginal people assert their sovereignty, they underline their sovereignty, they say that we are sovereign people. But they also, all First Nations people in this country, you know, some people said, hey, I'm a sovereign citizen and your rules don't apply to me. But in a material reality under our legal you know, legal system and politics, they are legally subject to the laws under the Commonwealth, right? Like I'm not saying that that's correct or just and, and people resist that, but I'm saying in a legal sense or a material sense, you know, Aboriginal people are treated equally before the law under the colonisation system and the Commonwealth and the Crown. Do you know what I mean? I'm not sure I follow. Aboriginal people assert their sovereignty and say that we are we are sovereign over this country. It has never been ceded, it has never been mm. taken away in any way. But they live in a material reality in which the colonizer settler state will treat them as if they are not sovereign and yeah. they are subject to the same laws as everybody else. 
Yeah, the laws, like British law, you know, the colonizers' right. law. Yeah. The government's law. Right, gotcha. Now, the Uluru Statement on the Heart talks about sovereignty and sort of says this, Ab- Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached there too and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown. Mm. So that's the Uluru Statement's position. And part of me wonders whether that is at all confused because I looked it up. Sovereignty is defined as supreme power or authority over a body politic. So whether you can have two sovereigns coexisting is like, can two sovereignties coexist that way, I suppose? Well, there's an an argument certainly that that, as they, they call it Hobbesian, I think, sovereignty, that idea of sovereignty, which is a Western concept and definition of sovereignty where there can only be one sovereign, one ruler of a particular body politic, of a particular land, that maybe there is a need to redefine or reconsider the uh, whether there needs to be just one and like kind of decolonize our understanding of sovereignty. Um, right. So interestingly, I would say, yeah, like quite a radical view of sovereignty might ask for that to be rethought and could say that, yeah, it could coexist with with multiple forms of sovereignty, multiple sovereign people. Right. We're really That's getting into the weeds now. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess, and the point of going to this is is at least defenders of The Voice, and there's been explainer on The Guardian, and I suppose lots of voice proponents and, you know, a select number of constitutional and legal experts have been asked about this now. It's, you know, mm. credit to Lydia bringing this question yeah. into the public debate, right? But they are being very clear, at least from their point of view, is that that, that this voice being written to the constitution doesn't see sovereignty at all. Megan Davis is a professor, you know, big voice uh, proponent, of course, giving up your sovereign entity to another entity can't be done through the Australian constitution because the constitution is an order that's been imposed upon our people. We haven't ceded sovereignty to that order. No one Mm -hmm. can cede sovereignty other than yourself or your people, your tribe, your nation. When it comes to treaty making, it is possible to either give up sovereignty in the process or for two sovereign entities to continue to coexist as they do now. Another academic, Han McGlade, said that uh, nowhere does the voice to parliament proposal suggest any agreement of Aboriginal people to cede sovereignty. To the contrary, the proposal recognises the right of Indigenous people to be heard on laws affecting our people. Indigenous people's sovereignty can only be ceded under uh, international law through the consent or agreement through a treaty. The voice cannot be construed as a secession of Aboriginal sovereignty by way of participation in the Commonwealth Parliament and Australian body politic any more than the participation of Aboriginal politicians on behalf of their political parties. Mm. This is, and this is a response put back to Lydia saying, you know, you became a senator, you don't cede your sovereignty while, while doing that. Mm. You know, wh- why or what, what reassurance are you looking for in this process that will tell you that if you vote for a, a voice to parliament, sovereignty won't be ceded in any way? Yeah, well, I do wonder if, yeah, when she, I think the way that Lydia put it, which is about specifically um, entrenching that subservience to the Australian parliament, like to uh, to this colonial government through, like to me, I understand that as through enshrining an advisory body voice in the constitution, because it's like that, that necessarily implies a body that 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 First Nations people are purely advising the sovereign, the 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 actual ruling government, and don't actually have power. So yeah, I wonder if what Lydia and other First Nations people would be seeking is something that is not just an advisory body to to the true sovereign. You know, <laughs> right? Okay. In which case, I mean, she's not going to get that. That fundamentally changes the very nature of and the makeup of the voice. In which case she would, I guess, abstain or <clears throat> or not support the, the referendum going through, and then we probably would have a uh, a split C if that is the uh, the status. But I, but I suppose you know, again, she's a sovereign woman. Aboriginal people are sovereign right now, despite all the shit, all the all the things that exist already, all the legal structures under colonization that have allowed that have fucked over Aboriginal people absolutely hundred mm-hmm. percent. But in those rare instances in which something like say native title law has allowed First Nations people to have control over their traditional lands. That is a recognition of the existing sovereignty being recognised and being made real and tangible under the Commonwealth system. And if this voice to parliament is truly a step towards treaty and we have this this, this body that can begin the process of Makarata and your lead us to treaty, which 
which would recognise, you know, the, the sovereignty of First Nations people to in a treaty between those two sovereign bodies. Isn't that a, isn't that a good thing? If you believe all of that, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to believe. Final point. It feels like undergirding all this debate is a question about the legitimacy of the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the dialogues. Now, we know Lydia's history in regards to that process. She she walked out. She's critiqued it a lot. She has political differences with a whole lot of people who are very much involved in the Uluru Dialogue, dialogue process. I think the Uluru Dialogue process could be criticised, both the conservative nature of a whole bunch of people who were involved. It was an invitation-only process. There was mm-hmm. a lot of conversations and dialogues. But those criticisms to me um, are undermined by the fact that we have endorsed the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Okay, as a party, that is the mm. official position. We've endorsed that statement. We have. Um, it was endorsed by more than 250 leaders uh, from various nations, including elders, okay, and and I think the idea that they were all swindled is pretty patronising um, uh, towards towards them and their intelligence and their, you know, belief in, in, a, in, in a political project like the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And so I think when we say yeah, we support it, but not like that, or we support it, we fuck around with it, or the whole system was a bit bunked or the whole process was bullshit, um, I think we're contradicting ourselves. I think that is an inconsistent position to hold. Yeah, I don't know. I think you can support it and still say this is how we would improve it. Sure, but, I mean, presenting the referendum as just as Labor policy when also saying that you support the Uluru Statement from the Heart, I think that's contradictory, right? Like it, it is the the Uluru Statement from the, from the Heart was produced through through a system that, you know, I think has pretty substantial legitimacy with mm. a whole bunch of First Nations people and elders in different nations. And then the Labor Party's policy is to implement that statement from the heart. Mm. Um, but how strongly did, did the statement emphasise that order? It it laid out that order. Like the voice mm. is definitely first. It says we, yeah. a voice enshrined in the constitution. Our end goal is Makarata, a, a, mm. a process of agreement making and uh, truth telling. Mm. Voice, treaty, truth. Well, yeah. Yes. Truth comes last. I don't know. Yeah, I, I understand. That <laughs> like, no, 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 I, I don't know. I understand kind of that there's a conflict there, but I also think that it's very fair to say that you, I mean, you can say you're a Marxist and, and absolutely critique a lot of Marxist like things that Mark said, and I don't know. <laughs> okay, actually, final point. Sorry. <laughs> On that note, I mean, I, I feel like we still have even left wing critiques of the voice and the vote, and to vote no. Uh, I'm still, I still have questions about. Have you reckoned with what? What does a no vote mean? I mean, as Bo mm. said last week on the. On the on the on the podcast, okay, radicals will mm. vote against it on their principles, but racists will too. What does it? What would it mean for Australia to vote no yeah. to this Indigenous voice to Parliament? What do you think about that? I think that, and well, I think that that's what I'm weighing up. That's what I mean when I say, yeah, does the uh, does voting yes to this have negative impacts um, that justify voting no, or is it just look, you vote yes for it because it probably won't have any significant negative impact? And the impacts of voting no, I think, yeah, it does mean that, that we probably won't get another chance. And it sends a pretty, it, it does, I think, send a message like, because the vast majority of people voting no would be doing so, be, like, out of a lack of respect for First Nations people. And that would be a rough statement for this yeah. country. I mean, Noel Pearson has said, I cannot see how reconciliation will be a viable concept in Australia. If the referendum fails, it will be shattered by such a mm-hmm. failure. It would be naive to think otherwise. Reconciliation will die with a failed referendum. Okay. <laughs> I mean, reconciliation, a lot of people don't even like. That's a bit of a, a loaded term anyway. It's all dead. No one, no, Nothing ever good will ever come again if we fail on this. That does seem to be uh, putting a fair bit of mayo on it, ironically. Yeah, but but also not only Australia voting no, but I also think the consideration in 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 pure political terms and considerations is is this the fight that the Greens want to be having for the whole for the whole year? Is is this crucial God, to no. to us defining no? And I think that is another consideration. Um, my my sincere hope is that through the parliamentary process we win some concessions, and then once it's out of the way and the date is set, the Greens are able to hopefully. Uh, Save the fucking planet from burning. <laughs> Talk about all the other shit, and and I, you know, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I've got a little, uh, little, 
little gay rainbow heart, but like to sincerely mm. believe in some kind of positive, good national sense of of goodwill for this this important thing uh, that Australia still has not sorted out. And you know, in the same way that the process surrounding the marriage plebiscite was fucking bullshit, but the mm. S vote was good. Yeah. Anyway, those are all my thoughts. Thanks for listening, everyone. Lydia's on Q&A on Monday night anyway, so that'll be spicy. So watch that. You can hear what she has to say for herself. And what should people do? I th- Yeah, people should check out the First Nations network of the Greens, a.k.a. the Black Greens. We'll put a link in the show notes. It's firstnations.greens.org.au. And, like, see how you can support the First Nations network, listen to the First Nations network in your member body, wherever you are. Read the, the platform, the Greens First Nations network, policy platform developed by the First Nations Network. And if you want to go one step further, pay the rent, put your money where your mouth is for support First Nations people, maybe chuck some money towards the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Services uh, service. We'll put the link in the show notes. But, yeah, First Nations people, undeniably, I think we'd all agree, absolutely fucked over by our current legal system, disproportionately targeted by the criminal legal system. And um, the, yeah, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services do a lot of good work across the country. Let us know what you think. Send us an email. Hello at seriousdangerpod.com. This conversation will keep going, obviously, uh, throughout the year, I'm sure. More spiciness Mm. to continue. But thanks for hearing us out. And we'll catch you next week. Bye. Serious danger, Australia.